Well, it's, I have half past four. So we, I think we, we start. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We will have now the honor and the pleasure to hear keynote address of Torrance Deacon of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he will speak about teleodynamics, specifying the dynamical principles of intrinsical processes, I suppose. Uh, he's, it's a plenary talk, so he will have 45 minutes to talk. It's your turn now. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon. I appreciate the interest of those of you who are listening, and I'm particularly grateful to the organizers be, being able to pull this off given the complicated conditions that this is taking place. Let me introduce myself briefly. I'm a neurobiologist and an evolutionary anthropologist. Um, I am not a thermodynamicist, not a molecular um, a biologist, um, but I have been involved in this for some period of time. So I hope you will um, excuse me for straying into an area that is somewhat new to me, but um, I hope I have something to offer. So I've coined the term teleodynamics to distinguish um, the distinctive modification of thermodynamic processes that characterize the intrinsic indirected dynamics that's characteristic of living things. Let me see if I can make this advance. There we go. Um, I begin with the following question. Are organisms accurately modeled and self-organizing dynamical systems, that is, dissipative systems. Self-organized processes are nonlinear dynamical processes that emerge within dynamical systems that are persistently driven far from equilibrium so that dissipation constraints uh, tend to accumulate and they generate, as a result, orderly structure. Uh, this is the inverse of the spontaneous order reducing tendency that tends to be characteristic of the second law of thermodynamics. This caused many people to come to the conclusion that living processes also uh, must be dissipated systems, uh, self-organizing systems in the following sense, uh, because they also invert in some sense the second law of thermodynamics, at least locally, and introduce stable ordered structures and dynamics. But there's a problem with this. The, and the problem is quite simple. that self-organizing processes, dissipative processes, are effectively self-eliminating. What do I mean by this? Physical systems that are driven far from equilibrium self-organize in the process of more rapidly and more efficiently eliminating the very perturbing conditions that enable them. But living systems, in contrast, are specifically organized to prevent self-damage and to preserve their internal order by maintaining their extrinsic supports. This suggests a paradox. Living systems must depend on self-organizing processes to generate system order, and yet must prevent these same self-organizing processes from undermining the very conditions that they depend upon for their persistence. So consider the traditional three laws of thermodynamics. The first law, of course, conservation law, energy is conserved. It's a symmetry rule. Um, it's interesting that this rule will no longer hold for open systems. Uh, we'll see that this is a serious problem, but not one that that's can't be overcome in various ways. I should mo note that it's also matter and energy, even in nuclear transitions. The second law, of course, an asymmetry law or a symmetry breaking law is the increase of entropy introduced uh, centuries ago by, by Clausius. And then finally, a third law was introduced towards the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, that defines a lower boundary condition, uh, absolute zero, uh, for standard thermodynamic systems. Um, I like to also include what I would call an implicit, though not part of the formal theory, is a fourth state function, which I call the maximum entropy condition. That it's an upper bound for a given isolated system in which the second law of thermodynamic no longer changes. So there's no longer an increase in entropy. This becomes the upper bound. Uh, it's different for different systems and different depending on uh, the configuration of those systems. <clears throat> 
The question I want to ask today is that can a consistent set of principles be formulated that characterize the major modes of open system dynamics? Now, I'm certainly not the first one to even suggest this. There are many and many that I'm sure I don't understand yet. Uh, let me offer my own approach to this. So the question I want to ask is what's required to characterize the aggregate dynamics exemplified by an arbitrarily bounded open subsystem. Uh, so a subsystem with respect to some supersystem that's embedded within. Uh, and uh, this is not going to be a definitive set of laws because, in fact, they will not be finite char finitely characterizable. Um, they will be changing as system and subsystem change and because they're in constant interaction with each other. So let me begin with a hypothesis. My hypothesis is the following, that there, can, there are seven key parameters that I'm going to identify that I think distinguish three hierarchically nested open system dynamics that, that are characteristic of partially bounded open subsystems. Now, by partially bounded, I mean a subsystem supersystem boundary that can be simply uh, observer, oops, just, uh, just a minute here, I lost something. There we go. That observer dependent, that is, we just simply impose that on the system. Um, uh, it can be some arbitrary externally imposed partial boundary or an intrinsically determined boundary. I'm going to argue, in fact, that living systems create their own boundaries. Uh, and finally, the, the, the symmetry or conservation law has to be ignored. Uh, in a sense, it's violated by open system systems. And so what we'll see is, in effect, a set of state functions and path functions that I think do a pretty good job, maybe not a complete job, and I'm certainly open to suggestions as to their alteration, as to how they might, in fact, um, help us characterize these systems. So I list seven of them here, and I try to caricature them by this little picture up here. Um, I'll try to formalize them as we move along. There's subsystem, supersystem entropy questions. That is, we have an entropy uh, that would be definable, although it's a partial entropy. Of course, it's not going to be complete because it's always changing and always in interaction with its supersystem. There's a change in entropy. That is a entropy, what I call an entropy transfer rate. Uh, I'll describe this also as a uh, entropy production process. Uh, that is a subsystem to supersystem transfer rate. How is entropy being moved between these two systems? There's a gradation. There's a gradient between subsystem and supersystem. That's part of the interface between these two systems. And then there's a set of constraints that define uh, the subsystem and define the supersystem. Uh, and finally, there's a set of dissipation paths um, by which that is processes by which one system dumps entropy, dumps energy, dumps material into the other system. Uh, not shown on this diagram, of course, there are going to be upper boundary conditions and lower boundary conditions that have to be considered for any particular system. So I characterize three levels of open system dynamics to help demonstrate the intermediate role of self-organized dissipated processes in mediating between near equilibrium dynamics and living dynamics. And I term them homeodynamics, slight variation from thermodynamics because it's more generalizable to, um, in a sense, open systems, morphodynamics, those systems that tend to be sometimes described as self-organizing, producing form in effect, regularizing, uh, and teleodynamics, which I'll use to talk about living processes for the most part. Um, specifically, I will show how the transitions from lower order to higher order dynamical regimes is achieved by the coupling of precisely countervailing lower order dynamics. I show that here with these arrows and how this produces distinctive inversions of each of the major state functions and path functions of the lower order dynamic regime as we trans transition into the higher order regime. The result is the emergence of regularizing processes in morphodynamics. That is, what happens is new constraints get generated within the subsystem to regularize it. Um, and eventually the emergence of regulation. That is, not only does the system become regularized and produce order and constraint, but it now begins to act actively preserve those constraints and therefore preserve that order. 
So let me offer my list of seven state and path functions and their values that I believe demonstrate the nested dependencies of these open dynamic conditions. So let me begin with a homeodynamic open system. Um, this is a system that is spontaneously near equilibrium and it's a standard thermodynamic-like process that we would expect to find. And an open system, uh, not, again, um, completely definable, but in which we find that the subsystem entropy tends to increase over time uh, as it begins to interact with its supersystem. The entropy production rate, that is the transfer of entropy uh, from subsystem to supersystem, over time will decrease, that is, as the system approaches equilibrium. That the interface gradient, that is the gradient between the two systems, will also tend to spontaneously dissipate as the systems uh, begin to equilibrate. Subsystem constraints, any constraints within the subsystem, uh, will also be degrading as these systems fall towards equilibrium. The dissipation path length between those, that is uh, how it is that molecules move from one to the other or energy transfers through uh, various path paths from subsystem to supersystem, these systems tend to remain unchanged. What happens is that the dissipation slows over time as the system approaches equilibrium. Finally, of course, there's the lower boundary for these systems at zero degree Kelvin. Um, at this point, of course, no system internal changes of states are possible. I also want to suggest that this is where we want to bring up this idea of an upper boundary, uh, that is, at which the system has reached its maximum entropy, given the nature of the material and, entropy and energy of that system. It's also a case where system internal gives free energy has now fallen to zero, so that no more work can be done by this system. That's familiar. Um, I'll try to list here in summary form what I mean by this, and I want you to pay attention in each case uh, to the, uh, in this case, uh, the equation or a non-equilibrium relationship that is the um, greater or less than, so that, for example, uh, Subsystem entropy over time decreases until it reaches equiv equivalent, until it becomes roughly not changing. Over time, the trans transfer of entropy from the subsystem to the supersystem um, will also decrease over time until it reaches equilibrium. The gradients between them uh, decrease over time. Uh, subsystem constraints will begin to break down and decrease over time. Interestingly, the path lengths, um, the path lengths by which uh, this process proceeds generally tend to stay constant uh, during this whole process. And of course, then here we have uh, those upper and lower boundary conditions described. Let me now move to the next one, and I just want to show the transition. Uh, in this case, what I call a morphodynamic open system, a system that we might say is driven far from equilibrium, oftentimes described as self-organized or dissipative. Under these systems, the subsystem in this case, its entropy decreases over time, and we'll look at some examples of that. That is, as entropy is moving through the system, as it's transferred um, into the system and out of the system, um, the transfer rate tends to increase over time as it will increase until it reaches a stable value. The interface gradient will also tend to increase until it reaches a stable value. The subsystem constraints under these circumstances don't decrease, but in fact, they multiply. The dissipation path length will also begin to decrease over time till it reaches a minimum. The lower boundary of such a system I'll describe as a homeodynamic mode. That is, it falls back to standard sort of thermodynamic decay. Um, when it's no longer perturbed away from equilibrium and it sort of burns up all the gradient, effectively it now begins to become spontaneous again. Uh, but it does have an upper boundary also. The upper boundary here is the minimum dissipation path length. That is the point at which um, the input of entropy, the output of entropy, in a sense, become balanced. Uh, and it balances at a point where there's, or in a sense, um, the path by which energy or material moves through the system, flows through the system, uh, basically becomes balanced. The result, of course, is often self-organization. Uh, again, um, I summarize this in the following list of seven categories. Notice that in all of now the um, red inequalities have been inverted. So in this transition, uh, what happens is that the uh, subsystem entropy 
decreases over time. Um, the transfer rate uh, which entropy is moving from subsystem to the supersystem now increases over time. Gradation, the gradients increase over time, again, till they reach a stable equilibrium level, a stable level. But now it's not equilibrium, it's a stable dynamic. Uh, in this case, subsystem constraints will also increase to a point where it reaches uh, its maximum. Uh, dissipation path lengths, interestingly, fall. Uh, they decrease to become, to reach a sort of lower stable level. Uh, under these circumstances, as I mentioned before, when this system uh, runs out of steam, so to speak, it falls back to a spontaneous homeodynamic state. Uh, the upper boundary condition, again, is one in which the entropy import, so to speak, and the entropy export uh, become balanced. Uh, and that's a point at which it's reached a, mi a minimal dissipation path length uh, for that system. Let's talk about one of the most familiar examples of this Rayleigh-Bernard convection. Um, and I want to talk about the relationship uh, between um, what I've called ent entropy transfer rate and entropy production, or the maximum entropy production principle that's oftentimes uh, been used to define uh, these far from equi equilibrium systems and their self-organization. I want to point out that in this system we see exactly what I was describing before. That is, there's two thermodynamic gradients in process here. One is driving the system away from equilibrium as heat is applied to the bottom of uh, this layer of oil. Uh, and uh, the other is as the system spontaneously tries to dump heat into the surrounding atmosphere. Um, that is a process of going towards equilibrium. These countervailing link dynamics allow the system to be set up into a constant transfer of heat in and heat out, entropy reduction in, entropy increase out, gradient production in, uh, gradient output relaxation out. These opposed thermodynamic processes, therefore, are on the one hand continuously driven away from equilibrium and another process simultaneously occurring that spontaneously develops toward equilibrium. Uh, so continual perturbation, so long as it's continually perturbed away from equilibrium, it increases the internal gradients, and this increase of internal gradients within the thin layer of oil generates work internally, which organizes the dynamics of molecule-to-molecule -molecule interaction to minimize the total dissipation path length, which I've described here as this path integral. Uh, basically looking at um, how heat or entropy or in the case of, you might say, uh, molecular momentum is picked up towards the bottom of the plate and given off towards the top. So here let's look at this kind of really con been our convection in this heated oil. Here's from a heated system uh, state one, state two, getting hotter and hotter to state four. One of the things that's happening is that the heat gradient increases from one to four, and it also is increasing in the depth of the oil. At the bottom, the heat is hottest. At the top, it's coolest. Uh, and this, of course, produces this difference in uh, density of the oil at the top and the bottom of this thin layer. Um, what we see is that um, at the beginning, during conduction of heat out of the system, uh, that's random molecular motion that's doing this job of conducting heat out. Um, uh, but it, when it pushes it beyond the level at which this can dissipate heat fast enough, um, the gradient within the system now builds up. And, and that buildup of gradient now produces a kind of work that begins to regularize the dissipation path so that it causes more direct alignment of dissipation paths, which we call convection. That these effectively progressively displace the less efficient non-aligned dissipation paths of simple conduction. And that's where we get convection and eventually the formation of these beautiful hexagonal convection cells. Now let me compare this to teleodynamic systems, that is systems like a living system. And I'll go on to talk about a fairly simple example of this as well. This is a system that dynamically creates and preserves its own boundary constraints. In one of these systems, um, the subsystem ent entropy gets stabilized, but it gets stabilized at a far from equilibrium state. Uh, the entropy transfer rate also gets stabilized. It's above some spontaneous dissipation rate, but below some maximum as well. The interface gradient 
between the subsystem and super supersystem becomes maintained, again, beyond equilibrium. The subsystem constraints within the system also become preserved, and they can also, in some cases, become multiplied, as, for example, one of these systems grows and develops a living system that is developing and differentiating may multiply its subsystem constraints. Dissipation path lengths, interestingly enough, also get maintained at a minimum. Uh, they can, in fact, um, excuse me, maintained at a maximum. One of the things that happens in living systems is the dissipation of energy and material through them, oftentimes over, over evolutionary time and over developmental time, and even over ecological succession. Basically, the path by which molecules move in and out of the system, by which energy moves in and out of the system, increases over time, reaches a maximum, you might say. The lower boundary condition for this, again, when the systems break down and regulation is not maintained, it falls back to morphodynamic processes. One of the reasons that living processes break down quickly, in fact, more rapidly than non-living processes, uh, is because they become morphodynamic at this level. That is, they become basically runaway processes that use up the gradients that have already been built up, the constraints that are already there break down quite rapidly. They become the basis of work. Now, what's interesting about the upper boundary of these systems, it's really undefined. It's an undefined boundary because of the capacity for living systems, for what I will call teleodynamic open systems, to evolve increasingly complex forms of regulation, that is, build regulation upon regulation. So again, comparing these seven state and path functions, what we have is that in a system like this, Again, there's a changeover of relations um, in which uh, subsystem entropy basically is held within a range. Uh, the transfer rate between subsystem and supersystem is maintained within a range. Uh, these are all regulatory relationships. Um, constraints are maintained, though they can sometimes increase, as I mentioned, in terms of growth and development. Um, interestingly enough, even the dissipation path links are maintained within certain ranges. Um, but again, these can, during the course of evolution, development, or ecological succession, can increase. Uh, in, in this case, we also see that the bottom line of this is that when the system breaks down, the lower boundary condition is a morphodynamic condition. So when living systems begin to collapse, they collapse quite rapidly. They go into a runaway, in effect, collapse. And finally, the upper boundary conditions, um, it's not clear what the upper boundary conditions are or could be. And probably we could identify them in terms of uh, the final outside ecological a context, the, the so-called heat bath of the, of the planetary system that they're a part of, for example. So let me give an example of this. And what I've tried to do is to produce what I would call, what I think is the simplest possible teleodynamic model system. It's a model system that's molecular. I think it's a realizable, empirically testable system. And I describe it as a kind of autogenic virus um, or an autogen, I like to use the term for short. Um, my argument is there's a plausibility here of a hypothetical non-parasitic virus-like molecular complex that's able to autonomously self-repair, self-reproduce, and even potentially evolve, though I won't talk about the latter today. It will have a chemistry and thermodynamics that's significantly simpler than known viruses. It lacks lipids, it lacks nucleic acids, and it involves only something like protein analogs. In fact, I don't think it has to be proteins, just large complex molecules a little bit like proteins. Um, and this is a model that I think is empirically testable. I have even suggested elsewhere that it may be the best model we have for the transition to what I would call proto-life, though perhaps we wouldn't want to call it life yet. An autogenic virus. So could there be a non-parasitic virus? I'm going to use a polio virus here as an example. I know we have some current familiarity with another kind of virus. I hope you'll allow me to use the polio virus as my example today. Uh, polio viruses are quite simple. They're small. Um, they are an RNA virus. They have a relatively short RNA um, sequence with not too many proteins encoded. In fact, four proteins encoded, um, plus another one that's used um, for packaging uh, and uh, 
and for um, initiating RNA, RNA uh, replication and, uh, and decoding uh, within, within the host organism. Uh, the question that people often ask, are viruses forms of life? And there's been a constant debate uh, in biology about whether we call viruses living or non-living. And yet, curiously, um, uh, we like to say that uh, we can create a vaccine. In fact, one of the great vaccines for polio was a so-called killed viruses. Well, you can't kill something that's dead. Uh, on the other hand, what makes a virus killed in this case makes it a vaccine. Uh, in the case of um, one of the vaccine versions uh, is that the RNA uh, is damaged or eliminated, and we just have viral shells. Uh, if you damage it so that it can't, in fact, um, get the RNA molecules to either begin the process of copying new RNA or producing new protein, uh, you can get the immune system to respond to the viral coat. Uh, now, what's interesting about the viral coat is these viral proteins self-assemble, and they self-assemble into this beautiful um, dodecahedral structure by virtue of the fact that the protein molecules themselves have a particular structure to them, so that when the three of the four, these three four proteins fit together, they actually form a nice tessellation that collectively will produce uh, a pentagonal unit, and then that pentagonal unit will effectively construct itself. Um, viruses don't need to be constructed. They construct themselves by basically falling together, so to speak. We call this capsule, this surface that con contains the virus, we call it a capsid, and we call the molecules capsid molecules. They're typically proteins, although there are much more complex viruses possible, viruses that include a protein capsid and also a um, lipid membrane uh, that makes it oftentimes more easily assimilable into a, an organism like our cells that use lipid membranes on our cells. Uh, the important point here is that the proteins fuse together by virtue of their shape and surface electricity, uh, and they bind together into complex shapes that effectively form themselves into complex polyhedral-like components uh, that can therefore enclose their RNA or DNA content. This self-assembly, however, is driven by the fact that um, the virus, when it infects a cell, of course, generates a whole lot more of these proteins that tend to spontaneously stick together and generating also much more RNA uh, within the cell. They get the cell to do the work to produce more RNA that by virtue of producing lots of RNA and lots of capsules, uh, in the same environment, the capsules tend to capture the RNA that produces the capsules. The problem is, of course, that this is a parasitic process. Viruses are parasitic because they're using RNA to DNA to commandeer the cell that they take, take control of. The question I want to ask is what other molecular processes might be able to replicate all the necessary molecular components uh, to create something like an, a virus, an autogenic virus, a virus that can produce itself. The answer to this is quite simple, and it's been pursued by many over the course of years, uh, and that is this process of reciprocal catalysis. Reciprocal catalysis occurs when, of course, um, one catalyst disturbs uh, and breaks up or fuses another molecule to produce another molecule, which itself uh, becomes the catalyst for generating um, another catalytic reaction, which in the process produces again, the first catalyst. And so you get a catalytic chain reaction here. And this catalytic chain reaction means that um, within a local area, um, more and more catalysts get produced. They speed up the catalytic process. Uh, they use up substrates more and more rapidly over time. Um, and as a result, they're a runaway or snowball-like process of catalysis until, of course, all substrates are used up or substrates de increase in local concentration, and one of the things that happens uh, is eventually the system stops uh, and the catalysts diffuse away from each other because they depend upon each other if they're not within the same area in local concentration. Uh, this kind of catalyst, catalytic process will cease. But this allows me to talk about what I call uh, the simplest autogenic kind of system or a minimal teleodynamic system. So here what we see on the top right um, is I've diagrammed the autocatalytic process in which uh, catalyst C is produced um, by a reaction among A and B, catalyzed by F, uh, 
uh, and C catalyzes the reaction to DNA that produces F. So you get a catalytic cycle. So long as there's A and B in the environment and D and E in the environment, this cycle will continue more rapidly, deplete the environment of both A and B and D and E. Um, but I have here also that the catalysis of F also produces a side product, uh, product G. And what I want to argue is that um, if product D G is a molecule that also self-assembles, we have an interesting phenomenon. If one of the molecular products of a reciprocal catalytic cycle like this tends to self-assemble into a closed structure, encapsulation of the ensemble of reciprocal catalysts becomes more likely. In other words, um, self-assembly is happening right where um, the most rapid catalysis is happening. And that means that there's a very high probability um, that in fact, the same catalysts that catalyze this reaction um, will in a sense be captured in an assembly. But if this happens, there's something interesting. What happens under these circumstances is that these two processes, reciprocal catalysis and self-assembly are in effect um, reciprocal to each other in very important ways. They produce each other's boundary conditions. Um, so, for example, reciprocal catalysis produces a high local asymmetric concentration of a small number of molecular species. But self-assembly requires persistently high local concentrations of a single species or a few species of component molecules. And in fact, during the process of self-assembly, that concentration goes down. But reciprocal catalysis will continually add to that concentration, keeping the concentration high and allowing self-assembly to persist. But self-assembly also does something else. It produces constraints on molecular diffusion. And molecular diffusion is one of the problems for reciprocal catalysis. Because as the catalysts begin to diffuse away from each other in concentration, it will slow and eventually stop catalysis. So in fact, enclosure maintains reciprocity, whereas reciprocity of catalysis maintains the capacity to build a self-assembling enclosure. The result is it produces what I call an autogenic work cycle. Um, and here I've depicted it in terms of the two sides of that process, the reciprocal catalytic side and the self-assembly side. Uh, reciprocal catalysis requires an energy um, gradient to drive it, um, but this energy may be recruited by the catalytic process itself as it splits molecules, for example, and produces higher energy molecules that can drive the process. Um, as this energy and substrate are depleted, of course, reciprocal catalysis will decrease. Um, but this replenishes capsid molecules that will self-assemble. Self self and this process is exergon. That is, it simply gives up some heat into the environment. Um, it's a process that happens spontaneously. This being a non-spontaneous process, this is a spontaneous process. This will, however, block catalysis dissipation and eventually when it closes, catalysts don't diffuse any, anywhere. But when the system closes, of course, it becomes inert, like an inert virus floating around outside of its host cell. Uh, under these circumstances, what we see, however, is that if the container is breached, like a virus being opened up inside of a host cell, um, then the process can begin again. In this case, if just collision with other molecules, with other um, complex autogenic viruses, um, breaks it open, uh, it will start the process again, and it will enclose itself again. So it's self-re-enclosing, and it encloses its own, you might say, raw materials to build the process if it's broken up or open again. Uh, what this means is that this is a system where the extrinsic boundary conditions for each process the extrinsic boundary conditions for reciprocal catalysis are being provided by self-assembly. And the exterior boundary conditions for self-assembly are being provided by intrinsic um, reciprocal catalysis. The two systems, um, in effect, um, internalize each other's external boundary conditions. They, in effect, become, you might say, environments for each other, though it's now internalized. What happens uniquely when this happens, of course, is that the boundary conditions are now non-arbitrary. They're defined by virtue of this complementarity. That is, the internalization of these boundary constraints, the reciprocation of these boundary constraints, means that this system is now self-bounded. That is, its boundary conditions are generated by itself.
So here in this fairly complex diagram is sort of an example of a process of a system inert here. It embodies constraints. It embodies both the constraints of catalysis and of self-assembly, but in an inert state, nothing is happening. Those constraints I call, in a sense, the constraints that hold those two constraints together, a teleodynamic constraint. And you'll see why in a minute. Because if the system is damaged and broken open, spills out its contents, um, and there are energetic and material resources in the local environment, it'll initiate the process of catalysis, which initiates the process of producing more catalysts, and initiates the process of producing more self-assembling capsid molecules that tend to do the work of enclosing the system back again and repairing the system. But now it's been repaired and put together with new components. Um, some components have been lost, some components have been gained. If it's damaged again, this can happen again, um, and again, and again, and again. I like to describe this as a constraint production and preservation ratchet. Um, in other words, constraints that are not actually active here are just potential constraints. But when the system is damaged, the constraints are released. And those constraints channel the work to reconstruct those constraints physically again in a new complex. And again, if it's damaged again, that can happen again and again. Notice that during this process, those constraints, the teleodynamic constraints that hold together the component molecular constraints are never lost. It's not lost when it's inert and it's not lost when it's dynamical. The constraints are preserved and passed on. They're inherited, um, but inherited with new components. I suggest here, the close, is that this gives us a hint to this long sought relationship between information and thermodynamics. We understand it in terms of basic information theory in which reference and meaning and value and function are not part of the story. But in fact, what we're really talking about um, in this famous example of Maxwell's demon, of course, is how information might be used to modify and play with the second law of thermodynamics. Of course, Maxwell's demon is shown to begin impossible, be impossible, but locally, um, we know that and there's something like this is going on in all of living processes. Locally, we're producing more energy in the super system so that the subsystem can maintain itself far from equilibrium. And of course, many people from Schrodinger to Shannon to Wiener um, have also tried to find ways to handle this story. Um, what I make, want to make a comment here is that this shows us that information entropy and thermodynamic entropy are maybe different uses of the same term and formula. Um, and this can be a confusion, but it also shows that there may be a deeper relationship between them. And it also may suggest that in fact, um, some of these properties, that some of these ways of talking about entropy that in fact using the same term may actually have some value. Let me go back to this figure again and just suggest that what we're really saying is that the teleodynamic constraints are effectively constituting information. And this information is organizing work to preserve those very same constraints. That in effect, the constraints are the information. And this is one way to think about Shannon information as well. Shannon's information in a message is embodied in the constraints um, on the possible messages that could have been transmitted. Those constraints are what are being preserved and being transmitted. This is in effect um, like the genetic information of the virus that's preserved from one instanti instantiation to another. So information in the form of constraints embodied in molecular interaction potentials is preserved despite, despite complete substrate replacement in this case. And it functions both as a record and as a source of instruction. And then I want to say that this is a hypothesis that we can test because it's an empirically testable hypothesis. It's that intrinsically end directed processes like those in life can emerge from codependent dynamical relationships between coupled far from equilibrium 
self-organizing processes that reciprocally preserve each other's supportive boundary conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very on time, perfect timing. Uh, well, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, as I have no way of managing the questions, please, whoever wants to ask something, activate the microphone and ask straight away. Uh, before anybody starts, I can have a question for you. Uh, I suppose your, your model is based on viruses. Have you talked about examples in other systems where this classification could be useful? I haven't actually applied it specifically to systems, but because viruses are simple, and in fact, the system I've described is even simpler than any existing virus. Um, it's one in which we can actually look at all of the molecular processes in detail. Uh, we can identify what the constraint, constraining conditions are for catalysis, what the balance between catalytic dynamics and self-assembly dynamics has to be for such a system to work. Um, this means that it's testable in a laboratory. Now, I don't have a laboratory appropriate to create this sort of thing, um, but we have lots of, in a sense, model virus systems to work with and other model self-assembling systems, including microtubule formation and so on that can be used uh, to pursue this. Uh, so I suggest this as a, you might say, a starting platform. Uh, platform to think about the problem in which we know the dynamics, we can test the dynamics, and then we can slowly build up to more complex systems. Uh, this is the I have a question. Another question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me turn on my video. Yeah, I'm a physicist. I know not much, too much about viruses, but is a virus stable like a crystal? If I keep a virus in the laboratory, come back after two years, does its molecular composition remain stable or does it decay? It obviously depends on the virus. Um, viruses that only have a simple protein coat are much more stable than those, for example, uh, that have a protein coat surrounded with a lipid membrane, oftentimes because the lipids um, more easily exchange with surround. But of course, it also depends upon the surround, as we know with any virus, uh, put them in a solution of uh, some kind of surfactant or, uh, you know, open water uh, and it breaks down their surfaces very rapidly. Uh, but in certain conditions, uh, particularly in dry conditions, viruses can be persistent for a very long time. Um, and uh, presumably, presumably a very, very simple virus in the right environment could persist for maybe thousands of years without any significant change. Um, so there is, uh, there are essentially equilibrium structures like a crystal is. Yes. Even I crystal think needs, if I take a crystal solid, Exactly. A uh, water soluble crystal, put it in the water, it will dissolve. But there are equilibrium structures that right. are working with non equilibrium structures like a living cell to replicate themselves. But these are equilibrium structures. Right. So, what I tried to demonstrate here is that we can use what would be an equilibrium structure in one context um, that is somehow fragile. Um, that when broken open in the right environment um, is no longer in equilibrium. It's now, it's maintained the constraints that keep it far from equilibrium so that it will reinitiate the process of self-assembly and reinitiate the process of reciprocal catalysis. Okay. I have a quick question. I, I put it actually in the chat, but I'm very intrigued by uh, your second to last slide, I think. I mean, are you positing in the end, after all that you've presented, that we should regard perhaps information as the primary and energy and entropy as secondary or derivative sorts of quantities in thermodynamic systems? So it's a good question. Now, first of all, I think we need to be careful about what we mean by information, because of course we're going to mean multiple things depending on, you know, our, our context. The argument I want to suggest here is that information um, about something, in this case, information is about the structure, the constraints, what I call the teleodynamics constraints. Information um, has reference 
this is not the same as information that Claude Shannon might have argued, for example. Um, in this case, information that has reference is a part of the dynamics. It emerges from the thermodynamic relationships that I've described. Um, it's, it is the constraints. Um, it doesn't mean that it's more fundamental in some sense. In fact, it's probably less fundamental in the sense that there is no information of this sort um, before teleodynamic organization. You wouldn't find this kind of regulating information uh, in a self-organizing system alone, in a dissipated system alone. Only a dissipated system that regulates itself in this respect. That's where it's information. So basically I'm talking about what amounts to how entropic relationships are compounded with each other in such a way as that they produce information that can now be referential. Thank you so much, Terence. Uh, I think the time is over.